Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. Today, I am joined by a very good friend and colleague of mine, Daniel McCarty, who is currently the Executive General Manager at AlphaCert, and we have known each other through various roles that Daniel's been involved in as well. So uh, welcome to the show, Daniel. Lovely to have you here. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, good so, yeah, good to see you too. So we met sort of many years ago, and you are um, an EOS convert, I guess, um, and we're working together with the EOS in the Alpha Cert business. But I, I want people to learn a little bit about you, and then I want to understand why on earth would you want to work with entrepreneurs and visionaries um, in your day-to-day job? So let's start by giving you know, sharing your story, telling me where you came from, how you got to where you are now. Yeah, that's, it, that, it all goes back to the start, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So I grew up in Malta, a mm. um, little island in the Mediterranean, a few hundred thousand of us there. And um, growing up, my dad, I'm the son of two teachers, and my dad, who was an entrepreneur from very early age, um, kind of got into teaching as a bit of a, a full-time role, but didn't quite was always unsettled in teaching and eventually left teaching to set up a travel agency um, and then spent the next 20 something years building up a travel agency out of, out of Malta, mm-hmm. um, which I worked in and I helped and so on. And it was sort of that started my love for travel, but it also gave me an insight into an entrepreneur's life. You know, my dad had, um, had uh, um, mental health issues as we've, later found out um it's bipolar oh, wow. um and uh the riding the wave of being an entrepreneur there are the highs and there are the lows yep. um and uh and doing that while battling mental health or an undiagnosed condition um it was was challenging mm-hmm. but i guess the, the the big moment for me was by then i'd con i'd gone off to university in the uk and and was actually working in the u.s at the time, he had a big episode and basically could no longer work. Mm. Um, and his business was not able to sustain itself without him. Mm. Uh, right? So um, a typical entrepreneur then. <laughs> correct. Yeah. correct. So in his um, late 50s, yeah. um, he had to effectively fire sell his business um, because the business was not sustainable without him would have been 10, 15 people in the business. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, his life's work um, didn't, you know, up in smoke almost mm. um, because of an episode in his, in his, in, on his health in his late fifties. He's, he's fine. He's still alive today and he's, okay. he's, you know, um, doing well, just turned 80 last, last month. Um, but that kind of taught me, uh, a kind of a big lesson around entrepreneurial businesses and and sort of their longevity and the legacy that that founders leave behind. And my dad's story is not atypical, right? Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's not uncommon very very common. Yeah. And so after about twenty years in corporate myself, global corporate roles, um, about ten years ago, I kind of came across uh, our, my first entrepreneur uh, who wanted to hand over the business to a to a to a CEO and I and I kind of started down that journey um, uh, of of kind of working alongside a CEO and I, I learned <laughs> I learned a few lessons along the way um, and came across EOS again a few years ago after a couple of tough tough uh, tough gigs as I call them um, and and I guess it gave me a structure that I could talk the same language with an entrepreneur on, right? I guess I could get alignment with an entrepreneur on something that wasn't just me saying, this is how we should do things. Um, so I, I love the, I love the structure it gave. Um, and it, I love the structure it gave us, me and, and the founder to be able to have um, conversations about 
the business yeah. right and what the business needed um and also i guess it, it mo most entrepreneurs i find kind of look for someone like me an md or a general manager or a ceo and then just want to step away from the business yeah and and then the business doesn't succeed and they're like oh i, I need a new G gm or a ceo or whatever right it, the yeah. cycle continues yes. um i think the first business I went into as the CEO, I was the th third general manager type person to go in. And, mm -hmm. and then I, and then I wasn't, and then, <laughs> then there was a fourth and, a, and it, you're kind of like, well, if you, you know, um, that cycle is not is equally, um, destructive to a business. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess unknowingly the, 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 what happened to my father, 20 something, whatever it was, 20 plus years ago, yep. kind of drives me a little bit to kind of see a better outcome mm -hmm. for founders and entrepreneurs. That's probably down in the psyche somewhere. But I, I also enjoy um, helping uh, entrepreneurs kind of build teams uh, and building culture inside organizations. So that's kind of my, yep. um, so as an integrator, I find, you know, my, my big role is to kind of reset the culture and organizations reset the vision and and and, and help really kind of People i guess that. set ourselves up for scale yeah. yeah no that's absolutely cool um i think you're absolutely right i mean i know um our good friends um sue uh, Stu and lisa kagan you know they they came in and spoke the other day and they were talking about the fact that the they were they're, they're a husband and wife team who were also working mm. in a business together with about seventy staff and and when I first met them they were always at each other's throats because Stu was very much the visionary uh, you know let's jump off the cliff and build the plane as we're as we're kind of dropping down and hopefully it'll all work out and Lisa was like no no the plane has to be ready before we actually take off and but in the past it became personal they would get kind of quite angry with each other because of the way each behaved and when they learnt about the the structure of the visionary and the integrator in EOS it actually gave them like a box to go ah okay that's why Stu does what he does that's why Lisa does what she does um and suddenly it took the emotion out of it and put that sort of that um yeah the the non-personal oh it's because you're a visual because you're an integrator Correct. um kind of thing into the business so I understand how that works and I guess you know with what you're talking about is these visionaries who yes they want they do want to kind of hand it over but it's not just a case of just going here you go it's all yours that, that it's better if we actually have some structure around what their role is in that what your role is in that and making sure that you have that and i made that same mistake i made that same mistake in the first kind of my first engagement with a founder i mm -hmm. i pushed him out yeah right yeah. because i felt he was interfering with <laughs> yes. the business um, um, and I was wrong too. So, right. So it's not, it's, it's kind of both. I think a lot of GMs, kind of CEOs that walk into founder led businesses kind of want to create their own sort of, I don't know, Legacy. their own <laughs> dynamic, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and are, 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 are almost too eager, um, to push out the, the founder out of business yeah. um, so that they can kind of set a new path and all this sort of stuff. But actually, the, the, kind of the EOS process taught me that that's probably the last thing you want to be doing. Actually, mm -hmm. there's the, the role of visionary is really important for some sort of these businesses at this stage in their life until, yeah. you know, they get to a point where where um, that's no longer needed. And that's quite a long way down the track often with businesses in the sort of yeah. 50, 100 people kind of scale. Yeah. And it's not to say that, you know, that, that visionary role, I think, can still exist beyond the founder. So I've worked a couple mm. of businesses where the, the visionary role, actually the baton's handed over when the original visionary mm -hmm. is ready to kind of move on, but somebody still has to take that place of that. And I suppose for those who are listening who don't really understand what a visionary is, um, we kind of describe it as the person who does have those big ideas. Some of them are super, super crazy. Some of them um, will never work and some of them actually will change the world. And the challenge is, is trying to actually filter through those ideas to work out what really is the good stuff and what is the stuff that will just distract everybody? And your role as the integrator is really about, well, actually, you describe how you, how do you work with a visionary to make sure that they are still delivering value to the business, but are not getting the, the, the leadership team caught up with all the bright, shiny object stuff? Yeah, I kind of, so I, I used to describe myself as kind of the, the interface between the leadership team and the founder, yep. right? Um, and uh, 
and really these days I kind of talk a lot more about sort of I effectively run and manage the leadership team and the business um, so that the founder can focus their time on the on those ideas and and those and those big relationships that we often have in businesses you'll have some pretty critical relationships whether with partners or or with or with sort of anchor clients and and so on right mm -hmm. um and you know that that the, the, creating that interface also creates certainty for a leadership team which is often not as visionary um and actually they've got day jobs to do and you can't keep kind of throwing a whole bunch of new ideas into into the machine and expect them to sort of still be doing their day job right yeah. which is kind of the environment you tend to step into when you step into a founder-led business because founders are just a million ideas a minute right. type stuff right yeah um which is awesome that's a that's a great superpower right uh, but um but that doesn't translate well when you're trying to operate a business yeah. Uh, and it, it almost often you'll hear what things like oh, we're a bit schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. One minute we're chasing that, and the next minute we're chasing that. And I'm not sure what my priorities really are because I was working on this, but the founder is really interested in this. And you know. <laughs> so, so my role is really just to create that. Um, I guess for the leadership team, create structure and focus and, and priorities yep. um, without stifling the entrepreneurial kind of spirit of the organization. Yep. Um, and I will often just, and, and I've learned kind of to, to sort of listen to the founder because their gut is generally pretty attuned um, and, and then, and sort of give it time to just percolate, mm. give those ideas time to percolate yep. through. Right. Um, and, and at the same time, the leadership team find it more comforting that they're not being asked to reprioritize things every week. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I give the example. I was working with quite a large kind of team. Whether the the the, the CEO, the visionary, was was an amazing person. You know, very very well known in the media. Super good, loads of brilliant ideas. But her leadership team, when we first came on board with the EOS, were literally working seventy eighty hour plus, um, you know, seventy eighty yeah. plus hours a week. And when yeah. I kind of questioned them, it was because they were always kind of trying to finish off projects that were thrown at them, but then another one was thrown at them, and so they were just always chasing their tail, never really getting anything finished and just just frenetic um, and just you know almost exhausted from the amount of work that they were doing but nothing actually ever got finished and so we put an integrator into that business and that was an external integrator who came in to to play that exact role you just described which is to to take the business plan create the laser sharp focus keep the team um, focused help them to remove obstacles and barriers keep the visionary a little bit at bay so they're not involved in the day-to-day -day stuff um, and it just fundamentally changed the way the whole business ran because it wasn't that the 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 Founder didn't still continue to have great big ideas, and but there was just a little bit more rigid, uh, no, not going to say rigidity. What's right? Um, rigor, rigor around you know picking what is the most important and making sure we focus on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you came across EOS. Um, what I mean, I, I know you said it appealed to you because it was not about getting rid of the entrepreneurial spirit, but actually some way of harnessing it. What do you think has been the game changer for you in terms of when you've put, because you put EOS into a couple of businesses now, what do you think has been the real game changer? Is there a specific tool? Is there a, a certain thing that you kind of go, yeah, that was it? Um, well, the concept of a visionary integrator mm. is is quite a game changer, I think, for most um, businesses. In fact, I, I, I would argue a lot of recruiters don't even understand it, mm -hmm. right? Because they expect a CEO to be both. Right. When they when they think about CEO or whatever title you want to take, they, yeah. they sort of are, you know, you look at any job description of a CEO, you've got to have the vision, you've got to have the relationships, the relationships, you've got to have the operating capability to run a team. Literally, you look at the visionary integrated definition, yep. combine it together and turn it into a recruitment CEO okay. position, right? That's, that's the truth. Yep. Um, and so, um, it, and then, and then in, in other situations, you get kind of people say, Oh, you know, you've got the CEO, CEO and then there are two IC. Um, which again, it still implies the CEO is running the business and the two ICs doing other stuff, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or the chief of staff. Or, or there's a whole bunch of sort of Technology. things. Yeah. I think for me, getting that it's a, that relationship and that definition of uh, and splitting of the 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 
uh, accountabilities um, is really fundamentally a, a game changer in, in founder-led businesses because it, it opens the eyes to a, a way of operating a business. Um, you know, in, in, in many ways, it's kind of the blatantly obvious when you see it kind of Microsoft and, and Gates and Bulmer and, and, and Jobs and Cook in Apple, and you, you've seen it in even bigger organizations, right, of those kind of partnerships like that, that work, um, that work really well. And so that's a big game changer. The other one is, I don't know that it's unique to EOS, but it, but it's the, it's the simplicity of the rhythm of the operating system, right? Weekly, uh, you know, weekly level 10 meetings, as we call them, um, you know that that sort of that sort of rhythm that kind of helps you maintain focus and maintain um, messaging, I guess. Yeah. Um, and again, the third thing would be it just gives a level of uh, consistent communication and 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 kind of understanding beyond just the leadership team. Yeah. You know, it's not often that you talk to an organization about the operating system of an organization. In fact, most people don't even understand what that means. No, no. <laughs> you talk about an operating system of an organization, but it's those rhythms, those meetings. You know, if you talk to people about Agile or Scrum, there's an operating system for mm. running Scrum in an organization, right? Yep. Um, they don't call it operating system. Um, there's a different set of terminology. Yep. Um, but, but, that's effectively what we're doing. How do you run a business on a consist on a on an ongoing basis in a way that you're not spending your time reinventing the wheel, hmm. but actually you, you've just got these rhythms, and then you slot in the the issues that you have to deal with every week and every month and so on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is interesting because you know, business operating system, yeah, you kind of go, what is it? I mean, I, I think it was a people management system, a people operating system. It's actually a, a way to make sure that your people are all on the same page. They know where they're headed. They know how they fit into the actual business. And, and as you said, that that regularity of meetings and looking at your scorecard and, and deciding, you know, looking at your rocks every week, like every single week you have this rhythm of, you know, where are we at? Are we on target? Um, are we going to achieve it? And I also think that tying all that daily stuff back into a much bigger picture as well changes the way the organization tends to think because you know you can get bogged down in the kind of business as usual day-to-day -day stuff but when you know you've got a 10-year target big hairy audacious goal you know you've got your three-year picture there is an element of okay um, in order to get there we can't keep doing just what we're doing right now so how do we actually improve how do we get better is that a fair mm. fair thing to say yeah it is yeah it is I mean look <laughs> I've been to I've been in many organizations where there's big hairy audacious goals, right? Um because that's how founders think, right? They are you know, they may off sometimes they haven't not often, sometimes they haven't even articulated it, but it they certainly they 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 talk about it um in in other ways of kind mm -hmm. of talking about where they want to be and all this sort of stuff. Um but that's too big for most um, employees mm. of a business to understand and get their head around right yeah. that's just a vision well, most people don't really see beyond frankly 90 days the next six months <laughs> maybe the next year yeah right most people in an organization they don't see past that point because they're they're in they're in the midst of it that's the whole point of kind of people in, in a business um the, the the whole one year and three year just gives a direction right yeah um just gives that that and and that's important for everyone to be marching towards the same hill mm -hmm. okay so you you've worked in sort of several different size businesses um what do you think yeah. the fundamental um differences are whether you, you know you've got a small team versus a slightly bigger team what what how do you use the tool in, in different, yeah, different size businesses, I suppose? Um, it's not that different, to be honest. It's not that different. The only thing you would do in a larger business is cascade it down more rigorously, right, right I guess. Yep. So the, the whole idea of, of uh, 
And again, it's, I don't know that this is unique to EOS, but EOS just kind of gives you the discipline to do that. Um, if you're, if you're running a, a, what a weekly process and then monthly process and quarterly process with your leadership team, mm -hmm. then if they've got big enough teams, they should be doing the same, same thing. Yep. with their team. Yeah. All right. Um, technically, if the company gets big enough, then that cascades another level too, mm -hmm. probably to not, but, um, it's, it's that discipline. And in a way, your first year or whatever it is, you're really teaching the leadership team and coach. And that's what you do as well, right, Deborah? Yeah. You help us coach, you coach us into how do we run a level 10 so that it can be cascaded down to be run with their, with their teams. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of to to a high enough quality that it's not wasting people's time because meetings meetings for the sakes of meetings is not yeah. it's not where we want to be right yeah um so i think you just have to be a little bit more rigorous about the cascading piece if it's a bigger team mm -hmm. um but you know we ran in my last role we ran eos across multiple countries, countries yeah. virtually and you know all all that was fine the tools are there today, right? To, to do all of that, so yeah. you, you, it doesn't need to be doesn't need to be physical. That's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's always nice to be together, but it doesn't need to be. Um, yeah. It is interesting. So I've got I've got a number of companies now that are, are doing a lot of offshore hiring, um, and they might be spanning across a couple of different countries in terms of their representation as well. And you know, um, yes, it's definitely nice to be in person, but it, you can do this stuff now because it gives you the the structure and the framework to actually do it. You can do it just by using the technology, and and it's yeah. almost as good as being in the room with them. What's yeah. your favourite EOS tool? Oh, the level 10 meeting by yeah. a country mile. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, because it, it, I can ask my leadership team now. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> I introduced it in week one. I felt I joined, uh, no disrespect to anybody in my past, but I just, I joined the, the, the business to, 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 uh, uh, my first, um, leadership team meeting. And I just said, I went, Oh my gosh, we're wasting. <laughs> I looked around the room and I think there were, at the time, there were like eight people. And I looked around the room and like, we're wasting eight times, one and a half, two hours, whatever it was. I can't remember. Yeah. Hours of, of time. Right. And we're really not focused on the right things at all. Um, kicked off a kind of a, a DIY level 10 until we started the process with you, Deborah. We started, we kicked off, a, I kicked off Daniel's version of level 10. <laughs> yes. It's very similar. Um, and, uh, and everyone's like, wow. This is so much. This is so much better. Yeah, we're actually focused, and we're talking about things that matter, and uh, and you know, we're not people aren't going down on rabbit holes and rants about things they've been ranting about for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think it just uh, just the discipline of it is amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? Because I'm sure if I asked your team, they'd probably say they really enjoy it too. And I, I see this so often is that people hate meetings or dread meetings because they know they're going to sit and just kind of discuss and discuss and nothing's going to be done. They're not good meetings. That's right. <laughs> the other thing is, you know, if you think, I think you're absolutely right. You think about the time that, where the people have bringing together their leadership team and they're sitting down and they're sitting down for two hours. Sometimes it rambles on and goes for three hours in a week and you kind of do the maths and you sit there and you kind of go, so we've got eight people sitting around it's this table. It's an expensive meeting. It's a bloody expensive meeting. And we're talking about, you know, something ridiculous like whether or not we should buy sit-stand desks for the team. And it's like actually half an hour in this meeting would have paid for sit-stand desks for the entire organization. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I've seen it happen a lot, which is, it's just human nature, I think. So, giving that structure brings back the focus and helps them to actually you know, do and the so right things. The, the simplest, I mean, I remember I think Stu and Lisa and I you know, when we first started talking uh, I think I introduced them to just I said, look, here's the spreadsheet I use, I, at the time I used the spreadsheet here's the spreadsheet I used to run this level 10 meeting yeah. this is what we do <laughs> and like, oh, that pretty much sold them on, on even just that alone I reckon sold them on EOS, just on EOS. They, yeah. they, they went down and you know um, and the other one, the other thing that always uh, you always use is the, the one of the books that Gina Wickman has written is um, a Winter Mark Winters is, is, is a Rocket Fuel. Oh yeah, uh, it's that was my uh, my aha moment is reading that book on the plane from Auckland to Wellington. Yep, and you can finish it 
in 45 minutes. It's a pretty right. easy, easy read, it's right? A pretty yep. light, light book. And I'm just remember reading it and going, aha, this yeah. is, this is, <laughs> this is it. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Actually, I, th I think all of the EOS, all the EOS books, I would say Traction is probably a little bit more difficult, and that's more of a how-to manual. But a lot of the EOS books, they are nice, easy reads. I mean, I, I, mm. I don't know if you know, but when, when they launched into New Zealand using my event center, I actually got given a couple of the books, and that's how I first came across the EOS. And I started, ah, reading, started, okay. reading, started reading Traction, kind of went, oh, it's a bit, this is a bit heavy. I can't get into it. It is a bit heavy, Traction. Yeah, yes. yeah, because it's a how-to manual. And I just – maybe I wasn't in the right headspace. I don't know. But then I got hold of Get a Grip, and Get a Grip is the, is the business phase fable that's told in kind of like a Patrick Lencioni kind of style yeah. where he tells a fable and, and interweaves yeah. EOS and traction into it. And once I read that book, and that was an easy read, that was just what I couldn't put down. Once I read that, suddenly traction made more sense. But all the additional books like Rocket Fuel and Process and um, what uh, How to Be a Great Boss, they're all actually pretty easy reading, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Um, I've, I'm going to ask, and this is purely um, because I think people need to understand this, um, the difference between working with an implementer and doing it on your own, what would you say you found the difference to be? Because you, you've been doing this for a while and it hasn't always been with me, but. Oh, look, for me, it's just, um, yeah, I, I did it on my own. as well. I, I, I executed kind of a US on my own before. I just think you get into bad habits quickly. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what I found when I operate EOS without an implementer is as an as a as an integrator, I get confused with the terminology, but as mm -hmm. an integrator, uh, it gets harder and harder to keep the founder uh, in the in the EOS framework, right? Right. Yeah. Harder and harder. Um, and and you're gonna have good times and you're gonna have bad times, right? Mm -hmm. Um the, the the businesses don't you know, I think I was literally at a at a thing yesterday someone who's kind of been in the entrepreneur space for 30 years and he said the one thing's for sure you the good times never last and the bad times never last yeah. it's a it's that kind of roller coaster right and so um an implementer helps kind of i guess keep the discipline alive mm -hmm. uh, between the the, the the team the inter the, the integrator the the um, the visionary founder um, you, you know when you attend a when you attend a level 10 meeting with us occasionally it just lifts us to, to the next so it, it it's no different to training in a gym you can go on your own three times a week and that's fine but yep. occasionally you should really have a trainer yeah. Right. Because your performance will kind of dip. Um, I swim and I, 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 I love, I, you know, I love nothing better than a, than, a, than a morning swim. But if I just swim on my own in a pool mm -hmm. week in, week out, my performance dips. Right. And not that I'm a very good swimmer. I'm, I'm an OK swimmer. <laughs> but, it, but the fact that, you know, this week I was told that I'm dragging my feet a bit too much. Oh. Right, it's something that goes okay. I need to, I need to kick a little bit differently and harder and whatever. Yeah. So it's just those things that you don't. It's it's the the unknown unknowns, right? The, the yeah. stuff you're not seeing. Mm -hmm. um, that's that an implementer really helps. Um, Plus, I think so, somebody made a, a point the other day. They said that you know, no, no kid gets to do sport without having a coach. No professional team gets to do sport without having a coach. It's it's just that you become an all person. black and you're still getting coached, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're top of your game, yeah, but you're still getting you're coached. top of your game and you're yeah. still getting coached. Um, you, so this idea that um, I think has become more common. But um, I remember we used to have this discussion when I was in, in uh, an advisory firm. You know, all our training budget was spent on the young associates and 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 then the managers but once you got to partner mm -hmm. global you know that's yeah. it no more training required you made it <laughs> <laughs> um until one day kind of someone went actually that's when your training should begin yes like you know if you're if you're a, if you're an athlete and you make the national team yeah you don't stop training once you make the national team. You actually double down and you train even harder once you're mm -hmm. in the national team. Yes. So um, I remember that conversation really clearly um, because it would just changed our mind. But literally, our whole budget was spent on anyone below partner. Yeah. Um, 
and um, actually myself and the, the, the visionary and the founder need just as much coaching and training mm -hmm. different well, you, you know we don't need you don't need certain level of coaching that that you would have if you're 20 years old and starting out but <laughs> sure. but, uh, but you still need it you yeah. still need it I also had, a, I had somebody give me a really good example about something. I think what happens when you tend to kind of do it on your own is you will start to form a few bad habits, like you said, and so or you might decide that you're um, even if you you know if you're a self implementer, you might decide that you'll do your version of it, and so you'll pick and choose and go, I'll have a bit of this, a bit of that. And I had this brilliant explanation of, of, of why you shouldn't do that. And this guy said, well, it's kind of like if you want to make a pavlova, um, you know there are certain ingredients and certain amount of time you have to whisk it and everything to make a pavlova. If you kind of decide to pick and choose on those ingredients and not put not put this ingredient in or add an extra ingredient you'll still end up baking something but it won't be a pavlova <laughs> and so yeah. it's like yeah yeah stick to the recipe um, and you'll get what you 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 expected <laughs> look it's 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 um we have i'm, I'm a member of um ypo young prisoners yeah. organization in in new zealand and um we it's a global organization and it, it, we have these again rhythms and 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 um ways of doing things and one of them is this monthly forum that we meet and and, and talk through and it's it's a really prescribed process mm. right that a bunch of ceos come together and you go through a certain process and um time and time again because most ceos are alpha type people and they want to reinvent things and they don't like being told <laughs> what to do um we yeah. try and reinvent the forum process and doesn't and and yes we have forum but it's not quite right, the same yeah. and every time we do what's called a recharge of the forum and we get an external facilitator in and um they kind of put you back on the track and go if you just did it like this it would be much easier much better <laughs> <laughs> and everyone goes yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> but by the nature of of senior people the reason we get to where we are in a way is that you kind of constantly improving on processes yes but you're right you can't improve on the pavlova right no no i mean the pavlova is the pavlova because it's, it is yeah it is what it is what it is so you can do other things but you can't improve on the, on that so i i find that that's the thing with an operating system that's proven across thousands of organizations yeah that you're well, hundreds gone. of thousands now. I think we're up to uh, two hundred thousand people. I, I, yeah, it's just my my my. You know, the 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 reality is, if you, the um, it's the same with um, we have that same conversation internally about Scrum mm. as, a, as a software development company. Yeah. Um, and my team talk about Scrum, but oh, we'll do Scrum, but we do these <laughs> other things. They're like, well, that's not Scrum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't say you do Scrum if you do Scrum, yeah. but yes. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you either do all of scrum or you don't do scrum you might do agile and you might do other things but mm -hmm. you, you're not doing scrum in its in its pure form so yeah. i think that's quite important because then you're not spending your energy trying to improve the process you're spending yeah. your energy trying to get the maximum out of the process yeah i think that's the other thing that some people get a little bit concerned about too they kind of go oh well you know eos is just this really simple model it's six basic tools you've got to work six basic areas you're going to focus on with these tools and and it's very cookie cutter and so you know it, it's it's really formulaic but it's actually not because it's just like just like agile just like scrum it's a framework but what you use or the way you operate within that framework and how your business runs with that framework is very very individual it's just a framework to keep you together on the same page doing the right things. It's not telling you how to run the business. It's not saying this is the strategy you must follow. This is the, the values you must have. It just says, hey, you need to have a strategy. You need to have some values. You need to have, you know, these bits and pieces to make it work. So um, is that is that fair? I mean, you've obviously used it in a number of different businesses now. The, the framework is the same, but the, what comes out of it can be quite different. Correct, correct. Look, um, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I've ever counted this. I think I've now worked in nine, maybe 10 organizations um, in my career, right? Mm -hmm. From hugely large corporates to small founder-led businesses. Mm -hmm. And every one of them thinks they're unique. <laughs> yep. Right? Ah, uh, yeah, no, we're different. Yep. Right, we're, we're different. Um, and, and it's true, right? Procter & Gamble is different to Unilever. Mm -hmm. That's true. Avis yeah. is different to Hertz, right? That's true. Um, but the, 
what isn't different is how you run a business. Yeah. Right? You have customers mm -hmm. and you have a product mm -hmm. or a service. Yep. And they pay you for it and you deliver it. <laughs> And, then, yep. and you and with that money hire people and they do things and and, and <laughs> you know that's that. yeah. so the you know it's not like um i don't know accounting standards are not the same across the world right um you have p and l's and you have balance sheets and it's not like oh we'll, we'll do our balance sheet a bit different <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i yeah. think I think prison starts calling when you do that. Sort of thing. <laughs> or we'll do our PNL a bit different. You, there are certain things you, you should do consistently, and it doesn't matter how unique your business is. Um, the way you run a business should be consistent, yeah. right? And and I think that's the now some organisations the way they run the business is their own competitive advantage, mm -hmm. and that's fine. Yeah, but. Those are kind of blue. Those are unique in their own way, right? That mm -hmm. the majority of businesses that sit in the curve in the middle are um, unique in what they do, but the how um, can get in the way. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. So it's gives you a framework to kind of work through that. Hey, Daniel, we, uh, we you and I could always talk for hours. Just in terms of top three tips, what are the top three tips you give to somebody listening in today? Um. First one, I'd say, uh, listen to your people, hmm. even when they you don't like what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and generally try and understand why they're telling you what they're telling you, not necessarily the what they're telling you. Mm. Um, the why behind it. The why behind it. Yeah. Most of us respond to the what and heckles rise if it's not good news or, you know, whatever. But try and understand the why they're saying what they're saying. Is it, you know, is it out of loyalty? Is it out of fear? Whatever it is, yeah. right? Yeah. Uncertainty, whatever it is. And then and then nail that bit mm -hmm. more. Um, in that same vein, I guess the second tip for me is, is communicate, communicate, communicate. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, um, it's never enough. It's never good enough. Um, uh, I find uh, this is very common to founders. Just because you had a thought doesn't mean other people can hear your brain. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and it's almost like I, I, the number of times I say, well, that have, how many times have you said what you've just said to me to everybody? Oh, no, well, you know, but I had this conversation with someone. I'm like, well, that's not communication, right? Yeah. Um, so communicate, communicate and, and there's, don't don't ever think you've communicated enough i mm -hmm. guess is the the, the truth yep. um and then i guess the last one for me is keep challenging your own assumptions um one of the biggest triggers for me is when people say well it worked in the past mm -hmm. this is what we've done for the last 20 years yep right we just don't live in that world anymore mm. That's right. You know, the, the yes, you should listen to your gut. The gut is different, right? Mm -hmm. You should listen to your gut because gut is not just experiences but a whole bunch of other things that come into it. But actually the reality is that just because it worked for the last 20 years doesn't mean it's going to work for the next two years. Mm -hmm. Like literally the yeah. world is moving and changing so fast and technology and people, what expectations and so on that – um you need to get different, I guess, different inputs into and take different risks going forward. Yeah. Um, and if you find yourself relying too much on your historic experience, then you're not learn. I guess you're not learning enough, right? Yeah, yeah. And as you said, it's such a such fast, fast changing world. It's important. It is. Kind of it is. Looking forwards as well as looking backwards. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Hey, look, Daniel, um, if anybody wants to get in contact with you um, to chat about EOS or even AlphaCert, I mean, you didn't tell me about AlphaCert. AlphaCert. I didn't tell about it? AlphaCert. No, yes. tell us what AlphaCert yeah, well, does. Yeah. Um, AlphaCert, which is my, my, my most recent love, um, is um, a, um, a data management platform in, in investment management world mm -hmm. so we're effectively um uh, a data middleware solution for investment managers that, which means we can help investment management firms um plug data in and out uh, more consistently we, we're really 
replacing um, Excel spreadsheets, um, <laughs> uh, spider webs of data that float around organizations. And, and ultimately, it's really more about better investment returns for our customers, right? Okay. If you if you can if you can have real control over your data, really understanding of what your single source of truth is. Mm. Um, Less then, room for errors. Then, yeah, you remove room for errors. You remove room for security issues. You remove room for all sorts of issues. Mm. Um, and so it's uh, it's, it's uh, we're driven by wanting better investment returns for our customers. Perfect. Uh, we do that by delivering. Um, you know, powerful software that, that simplifies complexity for our customers. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And so your ideal customer um, for that is? Um, anyone, any organization that manages money, assets, you know, investment managers, uh, superannuation fund managers, um, w wealth managers, they, they, have, they, they, they have a lot of investment management data. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, most of the time, we can simplify, secure, and automate a lot of that uh, yeah. for them. Okay, brilliant. So if anybody wants to get in contact with you, either for the Alpha Cert side of things or to talk about EOS, um, what's the best way they can get in contact with you, Daniel? Oh, look, daniel.mccarthy at alphacert.com um, yep. or 021-241-2952 here in New Zealand. It's my mobile. Um, or just look me up on LinkedIn. Um, yep. I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure we can, uh, we can connect. No, oh, that's fantastic. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next Great quarter. Great to see you again, Deborah. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Speak soon. That's bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life, doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at de debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.